opening celebration of the new Tan Yang Center for Autism Research at MIT. The new center was created based on a generous gift from Hock Tan and Lisa Yang, who are committed to a better understanding of autism and improving our treatment options. Autism is now known to be characterized by a spectrum of behaviors, ranging from severely affected individuals with intellectual disabilities who may be confined to institutions, to individuals who may be considered socially different from some points of view, who are probably well represented on our faculty here at MIT. <laughs> the goal of research in the new center is to give people on the autism spectrum and their families better options in the future than they have today. Now, those of you who are familiar with autism know that there already exists traditional funding sources for autism research, most notably the NIH, where I spent seven years heading the NIMH intramural program in Bethesda. My former boss, Steve Hyman, the director, former director of the NIMH, is, is here today. Uh, Steve spent time in service as provost at MIT and is now head of the, <laughs> of the Stanley Center. <laughs> where he's one of our closest collaborators. The problem with traditional funding agencies is that funding is so tight that they become very conservative. It's just human nature. In most cases, funding their research, their, their funds on research that's already been done and to avoid any possibility of failure. There's also little funding to support groups of scientists working together on important problems. Now, while NIH funding continues to be the lifeblood of biomedical research, the major shortcoming is that we're simply not making progress fast enough. We need to take more risks in our research and pursue new directions that may not work out, but may give us the breakthrough that we desperately need. We, as scientists, also need to work together as a team collaborating not only with individuals here at MIT and Harvard, but with scientists around the world. Because the problems of autism are bigger than anyone's going to solve working in their own lab. This will be the philosophy of the new center. We will take advantage of the tremendous new opportunities created by CRISPR, the revolutionary gene editing technology developed by Feng Zhang, who you'll be hearing from today. Fang Zhang will head up our efforts to use CRISPR for all new approaches in gene therapy in autism. From Guoping Fang, you'll hear about our program to create new primate genetic models of autism using CRISPR, and a program that we believe is unique in the world. Gloria Choi will tell us about a new program to explore the role of the immune system in brain development in autism, which builds on her stunning new results published in Science last year. And John Gabrielli will tell us about the state of the art in human brain imaging to study autism in the imaging center that's located just below us here in this building. I want to end by thanking Lisa and Hawk. We will work hard to realize their dream of progress in autism research. It's a dream that's shared by Laurie McGovern and the late Pat McGovern, who invested in the McGovern Institute because they believe that neuroscience will help mankind. Let's make it happen. I would now like to introduce Bob Millard, a strong supporter of neuroscience and the chair of the MIT Corporation. Bob. Thanks, thanks Bob. Um, good evening. This is a, it's a good crowd for a uh, warm evening. Um, uh, as you all know, we're here to celebrate uh, Hawk and, and Lisa's tremendous gift um, to um, to uh, uh, help catalyze autism research. I've personally gotten to know both of them independently over the past uh, year or so, and, uh, and I uh, was so impressed with them. I bragged them up to my wife, and, uh, who's, who's here with me now. Um, so thank you all for coming, but especially thank you to my wife for coming. <laughs> um, as, uh, as you all probably know, I don't think anybody on earth doesn't know that MIT is in the middle of a, uh, of a, a substantive campaign, and that campaign is called um, Campaign to Make a Better World, um, which uh, 
is not a slogan. It's it's a reality because um, most of you uh, most of you really know MIT uh, in a in a in a profound way, and and if if nothing else, MIT has has really dedicated itself to uh, to real world pro uh, problem solving, and has solved a lot of those problems. Um, and one of the real pillars of that campaign is is human health, um, and and brain science and its associated diseases is um, is really an important vector for MIT's work, um, uh, and it brings together a huge amount of of, of strengths uh, from diverse fields. Because as someone said to me at over cocktails, there is no silver bullet for for uh, for um, for uh, brain disorders, and um, so. Just off the top of my head, the things we that that really come together in this building are uh, cognitive science, neuroscience, uh, biology, obviously, um, basic science, engineering, computation, um, uh, even neuroeconomics. I mean, there's just you know, in true in true form, MIT just fuses a huge number of its capabilities and. and and, and and probably no more no, no in in no place more than in brain science, which probably is the most complicated science um, we anybody in humanity has ever ever uh, ever attempted. And in Kendall Square, which is which is what this is part of, we bring together not only the different capabilities at MIT, but the capabilities of associated um, institutions: the Broad, Harvard, Mass General. Uh, the whole uh, ecosystem of uh, of Kendall Square, biotechnology, finance, um, the hospitals. Did I say that? Uh, 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 apparently, uh, more than fifty percent of MIT's faculty are involved in life science research in one form or another, um, and a lot of it is a lot of it is uh, is is. Brain and neuroscience related. So, um, thank you again, Lisa and Hawk, for this. It's really this tremendous gift. I have so many people in this room and, uh, and among our friends whose lives have been touched by by things that we really can 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 help do something about. Um, uh, let me, uh, Laurie, you, you're going to speak. Laurie Harp McGovern, um, who co-founded the McGovern Institute, one of the pillars of, of MIT's uh, brain and cognitive science uh, vectors um, and the and the McGovern Institute is where the, the um, where the the tang the, the, the tang yang, that's a tongue twister the tang yang uh, center will will actually reside so Lori <laughs> Well, thanks for the nice introduction and the big plug for MIT at large as well. I know the campaign is in its midst and height, and as chairman of the corporation, it's your duty. So I get that. But thanks for the nice comments. And Bob, thank you for your nice comments. But I also would like to uh, tell everybody that both Bob's and Bethany are celebrating a special day today, Bob Desimond's birthday and Be Bob and Bethany's anniversary. So congratulations. <laughs> well, and I couldn't be more pleased than to have a chance to uh, say a few words as well and greet you, Lisa and Hawk, and your family, your son Nick, his wife Meredith, who's actually expecting a little ba a baby, and Eva, their daughter, Many of your friends and colleagues, uh, lots of members of the McGovern Institute and the MIT family at large. So thank you all for being here. Um, you know, sometimes serendipitous meetings uh, can really create magic. And I'm going to tie this a little bit more just toward Hawk and Lisa rather than talking about all the great things we'll be doing here because Bob addressed that already very well. But it's because of that serendipitous meeting that the magic of the Ten Yang or Yang Ten Center is the cause for our coming together and the celebration. <laughs> I really still remember so vividly when I met Hawk through Tony Sun 
at, as he just corrected me, I thought it was at the Asian Art Museum, but actually it was at the Rosewood Hotel on Sand Hill Road for some MIT function. And uh, uh, Son, uh, uh, Tony Son came up, he said, Laurie, no, Hawk, you've got to come over here, I've got to meet Laurie McGovern. And so we, we met, we chatted, we talked about uh, our Brain Institute and decided to meet for a get acquaintance uh, breakfast getting to know you breakfast, which we did on March 5th at 7.30 at Baywatch. It was a crummy little coffee shop. You wanted to go to something fancy. I said, I'm not driving. Let's go to this little coffee shop. <laughs> so that's where we met for about two hours. And that then segued into meeting you, Lisa, your daughter, Eva, and uh, Hawk at, the, at Pete's coffee shop at the airport in San Francisco because <laughs> it was the only place where we could meet I had just come back from Europe the day before. You were in Napa. And we said, well, how about before you fly out? So here we were at Pete's Coffee Shop in, uh, in, in, um, in San Francisco. Well, as the name implies, you know, Pete's Coffee sells coffee. And it's called Intensely Bold and Flavorful. Uh, flavorful, smoky overtones with a pleasant bite. And I thought that was actually appropriate. And uh, so I thought, let's share the best. I simply call it, it's not like having a Bordeaux nose. I simply call it unique, strong, and energize, energizing. And that copy helped us into a unique and strong and highly energetic conversation, which we started that fateful morning. And when I met you, Lisa, I knew exactly who you were how you were going to operate, that you were ready to dive in, discover, and you reminded me so much of Pat and me when we looked at establishing the McGovern Institute and where we were going to place in it. It was very reminiscent. And from the beginning, you also understood that we were not talking about, oh, can you give $100,000 to a lab? I think I made it very clear, you know, let's discuss a center because of your own unique circumstances, of your ability to do so. And we kind of, I think we laid that out pretty quickly. So when we had all those parameters set, we could really discuss how we were going to you know, structure and build the center that you so graciously funded. And then I also remember you, Hawk, calling me at 6 a.m from the East Coast, you did. It, for you, it was nine. <laughs> it was, but you know, you were still in a California uh, mode because Hawk doesn't live too far from where I live. Called me from the, from the East Coast to let me know that you were ready to sign the contract. And it was Christmas Eve. And I went, yes, yes. I was just beyond excited. And you almost apologized for having taken so long and you know, to you know, forgive you for having just bought Broadcom for $6.7 billion. And <laughs> integration into a smaller company took a little bit of time. So I think that was, uh, it, it was absolutely the best you know, present to science. The Christmas had arrived. It was Christmas Eve. For those of you who don't believe in Christmas, there is a Santa Claus. And you can call me, you can call me at any time or day with that kind of good news. <laughs> so Lisa and Hawk, Hawk and Lisa, you know, I just want you to know how thrilled I am to be able to thank you publicly, you know, for what you have done and how much you believed in the mission of the McGovern Institute, what we are trying to achieve here. And through the generosity of funding this institute, give our scientists um, the ability to help in advance uh, research into the underlying mechanisms of autism. And then through the process, uncover the mystery that underlies it. You know, I want you to know as a businessman, because you always look at ROI, you know, and I told you, I think very quickly, it's not buying a company where you shed the bad assets and then assemble, you know, the good ones and then repurpose them. This is not like the chip business. This has no shelf life. So the ROI that you will have is going to be infinite with our discoveries. Okay? So anyway, let the journey continue and accelerate with the addition of the Tan Yang Center. And um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be very formal now. I couldn't be more proud than to present Lisa and Hawk 
Lisa Yang and Hawk Tan. And Bob, would you join me, please, to give a little present that we have for you? And would you please come up because we would give you a little gift of appreciation. Oh. And oh this is cells, right? Oh, yeah. Yes, but they're from uh, actually an autism uh, model mouse. Yeah, that's why oh, the mouse the explanation. <laughs> right. Yeah. This is a mouse? <laughs> it's, a, it's a good model. It's a good model. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, now I'd like to introduce who would like to speak first. I go first. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Since my name go first. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> and that's the reason why I'll, I'll touch on that later, unless you want to start. No, 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 you go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, you're here? Okay. No, oh, you must stand oh, no, here. No, no. I gotta poke him in the by, lips. By the way, Laurie, Laurie, Bob, Bob again. <laughs> you know, since I've been here last, in the last several years, MIT has really profoundly improved. We got great salespeople now. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Listening to the three of you, great, great speeches. Anyway, seriously, uh, distinguished faculty, MIT, McGovern Institute, researchers, friends, family. We're very, very appreciative today that you join us to celebrate this event, this launch of the Center for Autism Research. We're really touched too for many of many people we see here in the audience who came from very far away just mm -hmm. to be here with us. Appreciate that very much. And in the interest of full disclosure too, since Laurie is letting it all hang out, <laughs> Lisa and I ha have a severely autistic son. He's now 31 years old, but I can, I can still remember vividly, so we can still remember vividly. We kind of figured something was not quite right, probably 28 mm -hmm. years ago, 29 years ago, and didn't know. We were living in Singapore then, he was born in Singapore, so <laughs> we trips, we pulled him in trips to multiple places. We went to Australia, some other places before I remember Hong Kong, perhaps. <laughs> Finally, we came to Philadelphia. I remember Philadelphia Children's Hospital. Mm -hmm. When we f kind of got a di final diagnosis uh, that he was, he is very autistic. So that's all good and fine. But what followed soon was care. How do you give care to that such a, to him? <clears throat> really, it's all about coping parents, family, siblings, scoping, care, and that pretty much take, took up all our a lot of our attention in, in terms of what we do next. We even hauled stakes up from Singapore and moved to Philadelphia. It's important. And it was interesting. And I let Lisa fill in more on the details of what it takes, as I'm sure some of you do know. Thank you for sharing that. In uh, to have an aut a very severely autistic child, it's not all negative, by the way, because my 31 year old today is like a baby, like my boy. It's pretty good. Doesn't grow up. But, <laughs> by like, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. But but it was uh, but it was all about coping, 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 and not in a negative sense. But it is. It's about care, and we know. A lot of funds go up, come out from government, private sector, and he has a lot of good care, a lot of care that could be better, and it's about dealing with a person. But more recently, two years ago to be exact, as Laurie said, I ran into Laurie. So I talked to Lisa, and she connected with Laurie too, and the McGovern Institute, and from through Laurie, Bob Desimond, Guo Peng, Feng Zhang, Scott Boyden, and a lot of others. And we start to dare to hope. 
we start to dare to dream. And the dream was simply that for us, selfishly, but potentially for others, that we could actually find a cure or enable a cure, not us finding a cure, but enable, support a cure for autism. And hence the genesis of this gift, this Centre for Autism Research. We hope this will do something, as you say, Laurie, not in the next one year, two years, five years even, for a long time. And we certainly appreciate your joining us here to celebrate that. I, I see a lot of familiar faces, and I'm so grateful that people have come from afar as well as locally to support um, what I feel is a very important um, uh, uh, venture for us. Um, it's not just, it may not be hope for just our family because it may not happen in our children's lifetime, but I think we need to bring hope to the future for individuals on the autism spectrum. Um, I actually want to express, it's not Mutual Admiration Society, but I want to express that I'm very impressed with the vision um, of Pat, who is not with us anymore, and Laurie McGovern to set up um, the McGovern Institute for Brain Research. I'm very impressed with the way Laurie, you know, whips. <laughs> We was a whip, right? So, um, and that's why we finally decided this is where we want to have the home for autism research. Um, I'm very impressed. On a very personal level, she has been an incredible beacon um, of um, an example and inspiration. Um, and I hope that I can uh, precipitate change uh, as effectively and as timely and as tirelessly as she can. So I'm very grateful, and I'm very grateful to her family. Liz, I know, is here, and, um, you know, um, and I know Michelle can't join us today, but I'm very happy that her family has continued to be involved and will continue to be involved. So as Hawk said, it's, this is a very personal thing. If I didn't have any children with autism, I probably wouldn't even be aware of this, but I have seen how debilitating this disorder can be, whether it's high-functioning individuals or, and because it's a spectrum disorder, it goes all the way to individuals that are very severely impacted. They have a lot of physical issues, stimuli, um, can affect them differently, and um, intellectually, as well as the ability to function in society because it's difficulty to read social cues. And I want to call out one individual in the audience um, Jose Velasco. Where are you, Jose? Oh, Jose Velasco runs the Autism at Work program at SAP. And this is the third, fourth, going to fourth year of a seven year pilot um, where SAP has said that they want to have 1% of the global workforce. What is it running? About 85,000 now? Yes. Yeah. Um, to be from the, on, uh, from the spectrum. So I feel that, um, and we were in Palo Alto for a, an Autism at Work conference. And SAP organized it at SAP Labs in Palo Alto. Microsoft was there. HP, IBM was interested. Ford, um, Towers Watson, HP Australia. So we have these companies that are stepping up. Because you know we're not talking about our children who may not be able to function in society, are kept at home, or they're playing video games or reading anime. We're talking about, you know, these are, f every individual deserves the right and the ability to be able to work, because that's where they form a social network, where they have a purpose in life. And I think they develop, and I look at um, these individuals as they mature, they will grow up, and they will acquire different abilities. So one of the things I want to leave behind, because I know we are really on a very short time um, line here, do not give up hope. And when you look at families that have children with autism, if they're very young and they have tantrums, be more compassionate and try to understand what the families are going through, what the siblings are going through. So that's all I can say, and I'm very hopeful and thankful that we can house this in Laurie's um, Institute. 